Over the past year or so, there's been a lot of discussion on whether the American freight railroads should be nationalized. Now, this is not the first time that American railroads have been nationalized, that is, gone under government control. However, some people, including myself, are doubtful on whether or not nationalization is necessary at this point of time. And today, I will be explaining why that is. Now, I'll start off by saying how nationalization has been promoted recently, and without naming any specific names, because I don't want to cancel anybody, I will say that nationalization has been made to... has been painted to seem like this sort of utopian paradise where Conrail roams free once again and the greedy, stinky, privatized puppet master Class 1 railroads are no more. Now that's what it's been made to look like, and as you might tell, that's not exactly how it really is. And I'll start off by explaining what has been going on with Conrail. Now, I will say I like Conrail. It's a great redemption story, and it's it has been a great help for uh, the American railroads, but at the same time, I don't see it as, like, the messiah of American railroading, which is how it's been made to look like. And the reason why is that Conrail had its flaws here and there, too. Especially after events like the East Palestine wreck, people have really been going after the Class 1 railroads. And by the way, why are they the ones being treated like puppet masters when there are so many other companies that have a big influence on America? But anyway, that's another discussion. But my point is, Conrail has had its flaws too, because one little interesting thing to note is that Norfolk Southern's wreck in East Palestine was far from the town's first derailment. The town has had many train derailments uh, over the past few decades. They had several on the Pennsylvania Railroad, one during Penn Central, and yes, one during Conrail. Conrail themselves also derailed in East Palestine. And although these wrecks did not have any toxic chemicals, at least they never mentioned any, They were still quite bad, as Conrail's wreck uh, damaged a gas station, which is, you know, something that you don't want damaged in a train wreck. And uh, there was one derailment that involved an Amtrak train, which did lead to the death of one person on board. So there have been quite a few nasty uh, incidents in uh, East Palestine before. So, yeah, that's not just Norfolk Southern who has had incidents there. And another thing about Conrail, and it's relate in comparison to Class 1 railroads, is that Class 1s have also been uh, criticized for cutting a lot of costs and favoring profit over anything else. And, I mean, this isn't entirely false, because obviously the railroads have done things like PSR and other controversial moves, which are flawed in several ways. But at the same time, Conrail was no stranger to cost-cutting either. They got rid of the third main line on their Pennsylvania trackage, and to this day, Horseshoe Curve only has three tracks. Conrail ended electric operations in the early 1980s, which is especially ironic since some of the people who want nationalization also want electrification. So, yeah. And then, uh, you might argue that... Oh, and also Conrail... uh, had a similar treatment with New York Central's water level route, where they uh, shortened the amount of tracks on that line, and they might have gotten rid of a lot of other lines too, all in an effort to cut costs and reduce uh, lines that were costing a lot of money. And you might say, oh, but Conrail was, those were in Conrail's early years, and so they were just trying to stay afloat at that time, which is not wrong. A lot of these happened during the mid-late 70s, early 80s, when Conrail was still losing money. But the thing about that is, if nationalization is supposed to be a, like, government-funded sort of thing, and people say that it won't be worried about profit as much as Class 1s, well, if they shouldn't be as profit- uh, concerned, then why are they still cutting costs and getting rid of lines? It's almost like they are still 
Um, profit is still at least some level of making money is on their mind, even in a nationalized railroad. Maybe it wouldn't obviously be as apparent as it would to a privatized railroad, but pri whether privatized or nationalized, there is still going to be some incentive to make money for any business. And that's going to be a recurring theme here, which is one of my main arguments as to why I'm hesitant to embrace nationalization, that being that there is still going to be some incentive to turn a profit, whether it's government-owned or not. There's still going to be uh, some sort of motivation for that uh, in some extent, to some form. And another interesting little note about Conrail is what happened after they became successful and profitable. Beginning in 1986 and finally uh, taking effect in 1987, Conrail committed the cardinal sin. They became privatized. That's right, the railroad that people are using to argue against privatization became privatized. In a way, it became the very thing it swore to destroy, so that's ironic, and it stayed privatized up until it split, which it kind of caused itself because it didn't want to be left behind in the merger games. And Conrail isn't the only American railroad that was once nationalized but now privatized. A similar thing happened to Canadian National, which was nationalized under the American government, or sorry, the Canadian government around World War I, stayed under their influence up until around the time of Conrail's privatization, I think it was the early 90s, and after that, Canadian National also became privatized and has stayed that way ever since. So here's two examples of two North American railroads that were once nationalized and became privatized after they became profitable. So who's to say that won't happen again? And let's also talk about a third nationalized railroad of the United States, that being the United States Railroad Administration, or USRA, which came into existence also around World War I. Now, the USRA came into existence because it was the middle of the war, United States had gotten involved, and the railroads could not keep up with the wartime demand, therefore making the government step in and run everything uh, for the railroads. And it was not until after World War I that the railroads came into private ownership. But it was after the war that um, there was some debate over whether or not the railroads should stay nationalized. It is true that quite a few railroad unions wanted it to stay under government ownership. However, several uh, groups, uh, including the Wilson, Woodrow Wilson and his administration, and the majority of the American public, mind you, all of them did not want America to uh, keep its railroads nationalized, and that is why they returned to privatization, because the Wilson administration and the majority of, of the public didn't want it to stay that way. And you might argue, but oh, some of the people who didn't want it were the greedy bureaucrats and the robber barons in charge of the railroads. And even if that is partly true, I don't think that would be enough for them to be the majority of the American public. Because this was around late 1910s, early 1920s. This was pretty much up at the end of the Gilded Age. There had already been a bunch of trust busting and corporate regulations that had been in effect for years at that point. So I don't think that uh, the big business owners were the only ones voicing their objections here. Like I said, even the government themselves didn't want to deal with the railroads anymore. And that leads into another uh, argument in that would the government even be willing, let alone able, to handle American freight railroads? And they already have a lot on their hands. I mean, they're already dealing with Amtrak and everything else that a government has to work with, so would they really be accepting of the railroads with open arms? And also with Amtrak, the thing is that railroads are already fairly profitable, at least freight railroads are, and the sort of thing about nationalization is that there's sort of a pattern that it usually comes around during a like massive sort of crisis in railroading, uh, let's look at some other examples. So, with the USRA, it occurred at a time when the railroads were 
the, rail, the country was in a massive war, and the railroads couldn't keep up. It made sense that the government nationalized to help the country win. Or look at British railways. After the war ended, the railroads were very torn up in damages and couldn't pay for all of that themselves, so it made sense that they were nationalized. Or look with Amtrak and Conrail. When a railroad is bleeding money by the day and on the verge of collapse, it makes sense that they would be nationalized. But let's look at the Class 1 railroads of today. If railroads are already well profitable, but just have some misguided decisions here and there, do we really need nationalization to fix things up? I mean, obviously we're not in a great position with railroads right now, but compared to previous events, I wouldn't call this like an urgent call for nationalization. And even if we do need nationalization at some point, I'm not saying that the idea is entirely bad. There are times where it has been helpful, but at the moment, I don't think that it should be the one and only answer to the railroad's problems. And let's say nationalization did happen today, and the freight railroads did go under government control. Well, would things change very dramatically? I'm not sure. There may be some benefits here and there, but that's not to say that everything will magically become better. And that's also not to say that the government will abandon some procedures, such as running really long, massive trains. As I mentioned, precision scheduled railroading is quite the controversial railroad tactic, and it mostly involves running long trains. But the thing is, running long trains is not exclusive to just privatized railroads in this current age. People like to say that nationalized railroads in other countries in the world have been so successful in the past, which is part of their reasoning as to why we should have a nationalized railroad. And it is true that other countries' nationalized railroads have been successful. They're not wrong about that, though it also helps that those countries care a lot more about their trains, but that's besides the point. My point is, if we're going to compare other nationalized railroads, let's also see what other nationalized railroads have done with longer trains. Back in the 2010s, SNCF, which is owned by the French government, experimented with quite long trains of their own under a project which they called Project Marathon. In this project, they made some rather long container trains just under a mile in length, which to us Americans may seem like chump change, but over in Europe, that's quite the sizable train, well over a kilometer. And even more than that, in more recent years, uh, Indian railways, which are also nationalized, have run several massive trains, which are now around the two-mile mark, and with that, they are well within American territory, on par with our PSR megatrains. So there are several examples of even nationalized rail companies using longer trains. And so who's to say that a nationalized railroad wouldn't use some of the same strategies that our current privatized railroads are using. And another thing relating to if nationalization were to happen today, and the Class 1 railroads all came under one owner, the government, that's especially kind of ironic when you think that one of the main arguments for nationalization, as I've already mentioned, is that the Class 1s are considered these uh, puppet master monopolies that control the country, and I've already made my opinion clear on that. But it's kind of true, because when you look anywhere west of Kansas, for instance, it is just BNSF and Union Pacific, and the only other railroad is a tiny bit of CPKC. So it is true that we have fewer Class 1 railroads than ever. We're down to six, which is crazy to think about. But I don't see how nationalization is supposed to help that, because then we'll go from six Class 1 railroads to only one, and by that point, the only competitors would be class twos, threes, and just smaller short lines. Those would be the only other freight carriers besides this big class one railroad. So it's kind of counterintuitive to say you're getting rid of a monopoly when this would only make for one massive class one railroad spanning the whole country. It's a little counterintuitive almost. And we also like to say that the current privatized railroads are oh so unsafe, and oh so terrible, and 
we look at the amount of derailments that happen every year, and we think it's terrible. Well, okay, there are a lot of derailments per year. Uh, 2023 had over a thousand derailments, which was obviously not good. However, when you compare that to previous years, that actually doesn't seem so bad after all. And that is because back in the, back in the day, railroads had way more derailments. They were in the thousands back in the 1980s and 70s. And it depends on the source that you look at, but railroads have mostly stayed uh, less than 2,000 derailments per year. And you also have to remember that not every single derailment is a town-splitting explosion like we've seen in East Palestine. A derailment could be as simple as a wheel coming off the tracks going two miles an hour in a freight yard. That would also fit the definition of a derailment. So we like to use these statistics to kind of paint the modern freight railroads as the bad guys. But that's, well, it's not great that there are still that many derailments. Compared to past statistics, it could be far, far worse. And it's not to say that privatized railroads are necessarily bad. Let's go back to what happened after the railroads were pri privatized following the end of the USRA. Between the 1920s and the 1940s, even with the Great Depression, the railroads had some of the most prosperous years of their lives. This was a time of streamlining, of experimentation, of innovation, when railroads were some of the biggest businesses in the country. When you ask a rail fan what they think of uh, when they think of the golden age of train travel, this era is what they think of. And get this, this era was an era of almost complete privatization. And so I mentioned that because I mentioned how even the most beloved railroads have been privatized, and some of the best eras in railroad history have been a time with almost no government ownership. And I think part of what helped make that so great was that uh, there was a lot of regulation at this time with the Interstate Commerce Commission, and that helped keep the railroads in check and make them not be tyrants, although the railroads were still highly successful. And it wasn't until after the railroads started losing out to innovative modes of alternate transport, which were federally funded, mind you. It wasn't until then, combined with the uh, regulations not budging, it was only then that the railroads started having their downfall, and we got to where we are now. So I think that nationalization is not exactly the only answer. And the reason I mention this is that maybe all we need is just a little more regulation. And I'm saying that carefully because obviously we're learning from our past mistakes, making it so that regulation is not, it doesn't take years uh, to spark reform like it did with uh, the ICC, which led to railroading's downfall. But maybe we do just need a little bit of regulation and a little bit of just more rules here and there without going overboard so that the railroads can still be successful, but also not make some unpopular decisions like large amounts of layoffs and um, cost-cutting and short-sighted decisions and stuff like that. But even then, I don't think that the railroads are 100% bad either. I mean, it's not like privatized railroads are not capable of doing good. I mean, look at some of the things that they've done recently. They've had heritage units. They've had heritage programs. They've donated thousands of dollars to rebuild the Francis Scott Key Bridge, for instance. And so in saying all this, my overall point here is that railroads can never be perfect. They, we won't have a 100% perfect rail network, as even the golden age of rail travel still had incidents here and there. But in saying that, uh, the reason I bring that up is because nationalization will not magically solve all of, your railroad, all of a railroad's problems. We're not in a great state right now in the railroad scene, but I don't think that nationalization will magically make everything better. And I still have quite a few doubts that it would ever be that big blue utopia that it's claimed to be. So that's my stance on nationalization. Let me know what you think about that. Uh, thank you for listening and watching.